In England in the 1960s, hitchhiking was quite widespread. It was thought to be a quick and inexpensive way to travel, but in 1968 in Surrey, a child who committed such a crime never returned home, making it one of the most upsetting pedophile cases the nation has ever witnessed. Before we begin this video, we would like to express our deepest sympathies to the family and friends who were severely touched by this horrible crime. We have no malicious intentions and recognize that the people concerned are dealing with a very delicate situation. We will learn why it took 33 years to solve the case in today's video. Our investigation today takes us to England, a nation that is a component of the United Kingdom. Wales to the west and Scotland to the north form part of England's territorial borders. In the county of Surrey, which is in the southern east of England, is the historic county of Surrey. With 1.5 million residents, Surrey is the 12th most populated county in the southeast, behind England County. In addition, the county is comparatively wealthy. Of all the English countries, it has the highest percentage of woodlands. Denby's Wine Estate, one of England's largest vineyards, as well as a number of smaller vineyards are located in the county. Surrey's culture is heavily influenced by music, comedy, and theater in addition to its abundance of art galleries. The Guilford Shakespeare Company frequently performs plays in the community and holds an annual French festival. Despite all the positive things that have been said about Surrey, crime is still a mystery. Roy Tuttle, a 14-year-old kid, is the subject of this case. To his mother Hillary and father Dennis, Roy was born in 1954. One of three kids, he was. The family resided in a little village called Brockham, which is renowned for retaining a sense of community that has been lost in many parts of the UK. Although his pals called him Tuts, Roy's full name was Roy Lindsay Tuttle. He also had a good friend named Peter who lived nearby. On April 23, 1968, Roy left his home in Surrey for school in Kingston, where he regularly attended Kingston Grammar School. He would never see his family again. He had boarded a bus with some pals after school at 3.30 p.m. on April 23rd, but opted to get off later to save money for a bike. He was nicely dressed in a red and gray striped jacket. Roy made the decision to hitch the rest of the way home, as he sometimes did. He was last observed attempting to hail a lift in Chessington, London. By taking a ride the rest of the way back to Brockham, where he resided with his parents, older brother Colin, and sister Margaret, he hoped to save money. Families today find it inconceivable that a kid would work a job to save money for a train set. Roy was reported missing to Dorking Police at 9.20 p.m. that night. The lost gemster was searched for the following day. Inquiries were made with bus drivers to see whether they remembered the missing kid, and photographs were presented to Tolworth and Chessington Zoo. The pill boxes near Brockham were all searched to determine if he was there, among many other inquiries. Others in the neighborhood were urged to look in the outbuildings to see if Roy had been hiding there. They also spoke to his best friend Peter to see if he would have any information on Roy's disappearance, but he was unable to provide any assistance. Parents in the neighborhood stopped letting their kids play outside because they were worried anything would happen to them. Many in the area reportedly felt insecure, which altered the way they lived. At Michaelham, Roy's body was discovered by a police officer around 1 p.m. on Friday, May 22nd, in a plantation next to a private road. Yet, 
Nobody was present when the police drove past that location at 8.15 in the morning. His leather satchel, which held a raincoat and his schoolwork, was found by his side. Roy's buttered body had been strangled and assaulted. His blazer had been put over his severely bruised body. Later, a woman came forward and told police that she had stopped Roy and told him he was being dumb since hitchhiking is risky, especially for young children. Regrettably, Roy disregarded her warnings and someone with malicious intent picked him up. A bus driver had observed a student conversing with the driver of a silver gray Austin Westminster Mark II, according to information the police also received. Short and stocky with whitish gray hair, the driver was characterized. The same vehicle was allegedly seen close to the scene of the body's disposal. A woman came forward just a few hours before Roy's body was recovered and claimed she spotted a car parked where his body would subsequently be found. She told authorities that she observed two men in the car, which led them to believe that Roy had been kidnapped by a pedophile. A short while later, the identical car was leaving the neighborhood at such a high rate of speed that it nearly knocked her over. A few months after the 14-year-old's bones were found, numerous silver gray Austin Westminster were located, more than 10,000 persons were looked into, and more than 2,000 people had their writing samples obtained. At the time, Samples from Tootle's body and clothing were analyzed, but the results yielded no conclusive information other than the fact that the suspect belonged to either the A or O blood group. When Roy's bones, his school supplies, and his schoolwork were found, it was obvious to the authorities that he had been brutally murdered and physically assaulted. The young kid was clearly murdered once the autopsy was completed, and samples from Roy's clothing were taken at the time that would later come in handy. For later usage, blood samples were kept in the freezer. Years passed during the Tuthill inquiry before a murder suspect was brought to justice. When the murder was broadcast on the TV show Police 5 in 1970, 140 calls and 14 letters were made, but there was still no results and the case progressively became unsolved. Vince McFadden, a sergeant who had been involved in the initial investigation, was Surrey's detective chief superintendent in 1989. Around that time, he spoke with a man who had confessed to the murder. He was a salesman who had visited the shop next to where Roy was last seen on that particular day. He also had the appropriate Austin Westminster car. Dennis, his father, died at the age of 46, two years after Roy went missing, and the investigation became unsolved. Hillary, Roy's mother, was adamant that one of the causes was the pain of losing his son in such a terrible way. Dennis had asthma, and it was terrible to accept that when his son was killed, he became reclusive in his grief and wouldn't talk about what had happened to Roy. The sadness and reminders of his brother's death were too much for his sister and brother, who both left to other countries, according to their aunt. As Colin was overcome with grief and craved vengeance, Roy's brother has felt a great deal of guilt. Nonetheless, he drove home from school that afternoon without incident. According to their Aunt Monique, he was very protective of Roy and felt bad since he thought he could have stopped it. Hillary, Roy's mother, eventually moved, settled down, and got remarried. She kept a picture of Roy on her nightstand because she missed him every night when she went to sleep and woke up. She was horrified by witnessing her son's final moments on earth, and she was also plagued by the knowledge that his assailant is still on the loose, potentially killing more people. Before a breakthrough with breakthroughs in DNA and more samples being collected, which eventually made the police have a suspect in their side, Roy's case went cold for more than 30 years and remained that way. 
It was revealed around the end of 1991 that a novel genetic approach would be used to try and solve the small boy's murder. Exactly one month later, a 64-year-old man was detained at his residence in connection with the murder of Tuttle. He spent the night there before being brought in for questioning. After completing his two years of national service, Brian relocated to the Surrey area where he grew up with his 12 foster brothers. He had two previous marriages that ended in divorce, worked as a technician for a business, and frequently traveled for work. He shared a home with another man and spent most evenings in the neighborhood bar at the time of his arrest. Just a few weeks after Roy was killed, the suspect, a divorcee, moved out of the Surrey neighborhood. A man in his 60s who was only in his 30s at the time of Roy Tootle's murder was a suspect. By the time Brian Field was named a suspect in this murder case, he had already been married twice and had three kids. By the time of Roy's death, Brian's first child had only been alive for two weeks. Brian Field has previously been convicted of violent crimes against young boys and had previously done time in prison on numerous occasions. Field was in his early 30s when Roy was killed because he was born in 1937, and as we already established, he had already been married twice and had three children when he was named a suspect in this case. Brian was made a murder suspect in this case due to a DNA match, the police organizing a cold case review, his criminal background, and previous offenses. His name was mentioned when the Cold Cases program looked at comparable cases in the United Kingdom. By that point, Brian Field had numerous interactions with both the legal system and the police. The pedophile cases Brian committed in the past involved young teenage guys. The first offense for which he was prosecuted was gross indecency. In November 1969, he was found guilty and paid fine for it. The second offense, which was more serious, was jumping on a little kid who was walking alone along a country path. Brian Field assaulted the youngster, who was 14 years old at the time, and made him strip completely. Brian Field was subsequently sentenced to two years in prison. The victim this time was a 17-year-old teenager, and Brian was found guilty of gross indecency in April 1982. For some strange reason, he simply had to pay a fine. He was once more accused and found guilty of crimes against young boys in September 1983. This time, he was charged with two counts of rap and received a four-year prison term. In 1986 in June, Field was last charged with a crime and found guilty. He was then given a new four-year prison term for kidnapping two teenage males. When word of Brian's arrest reached his brother Colin, who was residing in America, he remarked, Now that it's all coming back around, my initial reaction when I heard the file had been reopened and police had a suspect was astonishment. In the first year or two, I wanted retribution, but as time went on, I realized I no longer have that motive, and I haven't for a very long time. The police investigating the crime concentrated on this man because of this. According to reports, the police who were involved in Roy's murder had believed the guy who killed him was a repeat offender from the beginning. It was also made clear that, Despite the fact that the victim was the target of a random attack, Tootle's murder was the result of a guy who had gone out hunting for a victim that day. Later, two men who shared a foster home with Brian came forward and claimed that Brian had treated them badly. The previous investigators had learned about Brian Field and had made attempts to locate him so they could ask him about the murder of Roy, but he had managed to elude them since his most recent prison release. Brian worked as a gardener and at other occupations, but because he was paid cash, no tax or insurance records could be found for him. In this case, 
The information was gathered from the original sample, which resulted in a DNA profile in 1996, marking the beginning of the true investigation. When Brian Field was stopped by the police in 1999 on suspicion of drunk driving, it had been 13 years since his previous conviction and he had not been arrested. The National DNA Database had already been established in the UK, making it more likely than ever that someone supplying a sample in connection with a criminal offense would be apprehended. The police had to search for Brian Field once the DNA match was made, they eventually located him. Before disclosing his past homosexual and heterosexual experiences, Brian first denied any involvement in the murder of Roy. He was finally arrested on February 21, 2001. Field was unable to sleep that night, and the next morning he made a complete confession. Brian Field claims that Roy, who he didn't know at the time, got off a bus in Chesington. He spotted a young schoolboy struggling to find a ride, so he went to pick him up and promised to give him a ride home. However, Brian admitted that he had touched Roy on the leg, which caused Roy to feel uncomfortable and resist. This infuriated Brian, who then drove to a lay-by and forced Roy to take off his clothes before sailing him in the front seat. The frightened child was then driven to another lay-by, where he was strangled with his own school tie from behind. He later drove away after placing him in the boot of his vehicle and wrapping a blanket around his lifeless corpse. He then went back home to his four-month-old baby. Before tossing it down the alley where it was ultimately found, he claimed to have kept his body for three days. The young man had been killed violently. Many police hours were spent since Brian was driving a Mini instead of an Austin Westminster, but this is probably common when witnesses unintentionally give the police the inaccurate information. Brian Field was not yet convicted of any crimes at the time of the murder, and there was no evidence connecting him to the case. Brian Field was swiftly found guilty after the case was tried in court in 2001. He had already confessed, and the crime scene's DNA had been collected. As the judge read out Roy's sentence in November 2001, he said, quote, this was the killing of a normal, happy, healthy boy, an act particularly obnoxious for all right-minded people to satisfy your ill desires. This act and the consequences must have haunted his parents for the rest of their lives, and the rest of his family and friends still suffer for what you have been shown to be incorrect 33 years later. Detective Chief Inspector Philip Dial said, Brian is the most deadly sought-after pedophile, Every relationship he ever made was about grooming young boys to trust him, and when he earns their trust, he preys upon them. In addition, Brian Field was questioned over the 1996 disappearance of two young boys. According to accounts, Brian Field has been questioned, but nothing further has come of it. It was thought that he had worked at the nearby farm at the time. The murder of 14-year-old Michael Tyre, whose skeleton was found in a shallow grave in 1967, was among the unresolved cases that were reopened. Michael had skipped school quite frequently, and in 1966 he vanished without a trace. It wouldn't be until the following year his fractured skull was discovered, but due to the advanced decomposition, the pathologist could not determine whether he had been assaulted or not. Another case we're wanting to investigate further was a 12-year-old Keith Leon who was stabbed to death in 1967. Keith had been walking to purchase a geometry set. He was discovered an hour later with 11 stab wounds to his front and back. He, however, had not been assaulted. It was always speculated that Keith had been stabbed to death by other children. The police had three unresolved instances of comparable ages, but none of them had any supporting evidence or DNA that could be compared to Brian's DNA. 
A few days after Brian was given a life sentence, it was revealed that a police oversight had allowed him to get away with murder for so long. In 1968, a swap was taken from him in Surrey, but when he was arrested for drunk driving in 1999, police mismatched the swap taken in that crime with the swap taken in 1968. When Brian's DNA was ultimately linked to the one discovered on the crime scene in 2001, it is a blessing that he did not hurt any children between 1999 and 2001. In honor of Roy, Silk Tussle, a shrub was planted in Kingston's London Road the next month. Regrettably, Roy's parents had passed away before Brian got jailed. We can only imagine what a nightmare this has been for the family and how their lives have all changed forever as a result of Roy's brother moving to the United States. Although it took 33 years to find the perpetrator, the police never lost hope of apprehending him over the years. The Roy Tootle murder case was the oldest unsolved cold case in the UK. Additionally, it was disclosed that the police had interviewed over 10,000 persons and had recorded over 2,000 testimonies throughout the years. Brian is still alive and incarcerated. If you have any comments, please post them below. See you in the following video.